Another big shakeup in the Trump administration, perhaps the biggest of all thus far in this uh, relatively brief span of, what is it, 18 months now, gentlemen, something like that, going Not on that. that um, I'm Scott Out with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. This episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, is out. Mike Pompeo, the former, the now former CIA director, is uh, Trump's nominee to take over at the helm at state. And Gina Haspel uh, has been elevated to deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency with the thought that she will be confirmed as the head of the CIA. Lots of activity this week, lots of news going on in the week after we hear that President Trump plans to meet uh, possibly directly with Kim Jong-un, the uh, North Korean dictator, to discuss uh, nuclear issues. Um, you know, it's, it's, gentlemen, it's hard to know where to start here because there's so much of significance. Let me just first give you a general question, then I'd like to follow up specifically. Um, Stephen Green, as, as all this, you know, sort of rolled over the transom this morning, um, what was your immediate reaction? <laughs> I laughed. Uh, look, if, if you weren't expecting a certain level of chaos from the Trump White House, then you have not turned on your television or looked at a, a New York-based magazine in the last 35 years because it, it, it's how he's lived his life it's how he's run his various businesses and you know for the most part it works for him uh you know the the the, the guy's rich he has all these properties he's president of the united states so clearly this is a guy who thrives on his own chaos uh, it, it may be a little less uh, thriving for those around him and i get the feeling that by the last year of his administration he's going to be the only guy left in the building maybe but uh it, it, it it's worked for him so far uh my next thought was rex tillerson was not a man who had any great interest in being secretary of state or any great vision like a uh, like a kissinger or a uh uh so, no, not him. Anyway, he, he he wasn't all that interested in the job. He he didn't even staff up the administ his administration at state. There were all of these open jobs. There were all these Obama leftovers. And as a man without a, a mission or a purpose in his job, he simply let the Obama people continue and didn't rehire to fill the vacancies. And he achieved basically nothing in the State Department. And I think that, uh, that Mike Pompeo is going to be a big step up. I think this is a guy who has a vision for our, for our foreign policy, and maybe we'll see some, some fruits for that uh, coming up uh, in North Korea. That said, I just, I'd, I'd like to finish by saying uh, something to our boss, Bill Whittle, sitting uh, over my, uh, at my side there, your side. Bill, if you ever feel the need to fire me, please don't put it out in a tweet to, to 300 million people there on Twitter. I want you to be a man about it and fire me right to my Facebook page. That's right. If I, if I have 300 million followers on Twitter, you're not going to be fired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at least have the decency to do it on Snapchat. Um, you know, Bill, it occurs to me, as Steve says that, you know, if you're if you're Rex Tillerson, you know, sort of putting stuff in a cardboard box now and, and having security watch you as you empty your desk, um, you're headed out. You're like, wait a minute. Two years ago, I was running Exxon. Now I'm getting fired on Twitter. <laughs> you know, uh, Trump said something that uh, I'm sure he said just simply to make uh, the, the progressive head explode because that's his job. That's what he does. He does it very, very well. But I saw him in front of a group of people a couple days ago, and he said, you know, this being president thing is not that hard. It, you'd be bored, really. You'd be <laughs> bored. And, and uh, on some level, I suspect he probably is a little. Um, his, his management style has seemed to be, and this is, I think, quite a good management style for the president or for a, for a businessman, find competent people who, who are on the same page, give them their heads, and if they're successful, then keep them and promote them and give more money. And if they're not, then find somebody who, who can do this. Um, and I think it's pretty clear Rex Tillerson never really delivered. He's been kind of the non-entity of the whole yeah. uh, administration. I mean, I don't ever remember seeing him uh, speaking or, or anything like that. Uh, I think Trump's foreign policy achievements actually are more 
really from Donald Trump, the, the yeah. number one thing I think would be, you know, a, com an enormous repair of our relationship with Israel, which I put very high on our list of, of national uh, domestic, I'm sorry, national um, diplomatic uh, priorities. And I think dropping a Moab on the second or third day in office or whatever the case may be, not only convinced that um, uh, Taliban and, and, um, and the rest of these um, people that, uh, that we were serious, but I think it showed the rest of the world that we're serious too. Uh, I, it, <laughs> you know, Scott was expressing some reservations on our pre-show uh, about having a CIA chief being the head of um, state, being secretary of state. I just think it'd be a nice change if we had a Secretary of State that knew something about other countries, you know? I just think that might be a, a useful thing to have in that office. Well, we'll, we'll see if we get one of those. And, and, Trump, and Trump hasn't fired his good people, by the way. You know, um, Mattis is still there and Nikki Haley and, and you know, that, so that's, that's the way I look at it. The only reason he didn't say McMaster is because he just didn't want to hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's still there, right? He is. Yeah, he is. Despite weekly uh, prophecies. Oh, um, yeah, the rumors never stop on that one. You know, Stephen Green, Gina Haspel uh, was a clandestine CIA officer who uh, apparently, even though she was clandestine, we know a lot of stuff about her. <laughs> so we know that she was running some CIA black sites, that she oversaw the uh, the waterboarding of a couple of uh, terrorists. And uh, this uh, this news that a woman may soon become the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, you, as you would expect in the New York Times, was trumpeted as a great step forward for women's rights, was it not? No, it wasn't. They didn't even mention it. Look, the, the, the greatest headline of all time came from uh, uh, the New York Post, and it was uh, Headless Body Found in Topless Bar. <laughs> and right. the, with real story from the 70s, uh, mob hit, I believe. And yeah. the and, and the best fake headline of all time was uh, supposedly from the New York Times that it's world to end tomorrow. Women and minorities affected most. Hardest hit. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> or hardest hit. Yeah. Uh, greatest fake headline of all time. So here it is. Our first female CIA director. And as far as the New York Times is concerned, that is a non-story. You, you can't win with the New York Times. You shouldn't even try. And one of my favorite things about President Trump is his constant denunciations of fake news. Maybe he's not 100% accurate on what he thinks is fake news, but just to have somebody high level calling out these Caesar Flickermans that populate our mainstream media just makes me happy. <laughs> so, I mean, Bill, you've already expressed that you have no concerns about having the, the former CIA director, albeit a short-lived CIA director, wasn't there very long, uh, being, being at the head of state. Um, how do you feel about having uh, the new CIA director been someone who apparently had direct oversight of the the thing that we have all, you know, and, and by we have all, I mean, Republicans and Democrats alike have stepped back from the whole idea of us waterboarding and having these black sites, these off book uh, places where we can ship um, suspects or uh, combatants to other countries and have them dealt with in a more severe manner than our own laws would allow. Now this person that we've all said, well, this is not who we are, is who we are, is the, going to be the director of the CIA, it looks like. How do you feel about that? When the waterboarding thing first came up, I want to say 2004 or five, somewhere around in there, three or four or five, after a year or two after 9-11, there's this enormous debate about it. And, you know, is it torture? Is it really torture? And there was also a release of some of the interrogation techniques we used, like uh, a false wall. So if you threw somebody against the wall, they felt like they were hurt worse than they actually were, these kind of things. And I remember thinking um, I would be willing to be waterboarded for the sake of this argument. And let me be crystal clear on this. When I say that, I don't mean that I think I would be able to withstand waterboarding or that I would be able to, you know, just tough it out but I would be willing to do it. And it turns out Steve Crowder was willing to do it and he went 12 seconds or something like that. It is extremely unpleasant, yeah. but there are some things that I would not be willing to have done to me, like having my teeth knocked out with a rifle butt or things of that nature. So the entire question you're asking me is hinging on what do I think of the moral stature of waterboarding? How heinous do I find this? Um, if, if she was there, um, you know, cutting off fingers and pulling skin off people with hooks, 
I would find that to be a bit disqualifying. Uh, the, the, I, look, here's the thing I think that's important about the waterboarding thing, okay? Uh, it's been a limited number of people, quite a limited number of people. I, I believe Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded a, a, a significant number of times, you know, or 120 or something like that. But they were not waterboarding him to see if he was guilty or to get a confession out of the guy. They were trying to get operational information out of him, and when they finally did break him, they got a lot of operational information out of a man who murdered 3,000 people in cold blood. So, in terms of waterboarding uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, you're not going to find a great deal of sympathy from me. If it can save more lives, the man... What do you say about a guy like that? I don't know anything about the people that were interrogated under her watch. I suspect that if it happened, there was probably a uh, pretty good reason for doing that. I know a lot of people look at this and say, how could you possibly be so or savage or what do you expect from a, you know, Nazi, racist, homophobe, Islamophobe uh, like myself? But there is an equation here, and the equation is simple. If there are, we, we don't routinely waterboard people, so if somebody is, is having this procedure done to them, it's because we already know that they know about stuff that's very, very important. And I, frankly, am less concerned about Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's comfort level than I am about four-year-old girl on an airliner flying to Hawaii that explodes in midair along with 10 other airliners exploding midair and all of them plumbing it in, into the Pacific Ocean from 38,000 feet. I put that higher than I do his personal comfort. And, and we found out about that plot because of this. You know, you. They, they want to have it both ways. And I'm not willing to, I'm not will, that, this, now we're on the heart of the matter, okay? I'm not willing to, to be enough of a hypocrite to want it both ways. I would prefer that these uh, innocent people, innocent Americans, and other people around the world live in safety so long as this is confined to people who are known already to do them harm. I, I put that ahead of that, I do. Um, and when these attacks don't happen, no one says anything about why they didn't happen. But if they hadn't done that, and it had happened, and 10 airliners had exploded over the Pacific Ocean simultaneously, then you're looking at another 3,000 people killed, and we found out that we could have prevented this if we had waterboarded a man who'd already murdered 3,000 people in New York, that would make me angry. You know, the, their political parties tend to have a limited set of scripts. They've got a playbook. And they go to their their, um, their sort of three ring binder that they have tabbed out um, every time something happens. So immediately the Democrats in this case, when a female is appointed as the director or soon to be perhaps the director of the CIA, well, that wouldn't do. I mean, that would actually be a great tab to flip to in your three ring binder if President Obama had appointed a woman to that position. <laughs> and we would have gone right to the advance uh, that is made possible only by democratic policies for women and their rights and, and their respect for their leadership. Um, but because it's Republicans, we immediately have to flip to the tab that says torture. And so we immediately go and sort of relitigate those cases um, when clearly even if this woman was overseeing these things, if Gina Haspel was overseeing these things, she was doing so on orders. So, she, you know, this, she's not some rogue agent who's out there doing as she pleases. And so uh, what, I, what concerns me about this whole thing is the idea that for some reason, President Trump, uh, as chief executive of this country, is not entitled to his own appointees. And it, it, the story, if you read down far enough in the New York Times story about Gina Haspel, the new deputy director of the CIA, what you'll find is she's universally respected by people on both sides of the aisle. And they actually had a bunch of praise for her from like James Clapper, you know, <laughs> from the Obama administration and others uh, from the Obama administration. But we can't we can't focus on that. We can't say, wow, what a historic moment for women. Instead, we have to go and relitigate the torture thing. The other thing is the idea that the president of the United States is not entitled to fire people. Um, I, I was once in a very low political position. I was a county commissioner. And at one point, the executive director, um, the executive of the county was appointing a director of administration. And some of my colleagues on my side of the aisle didn't like his appointee. And I said, 
his appointee is legally qualified for the job and the executive is entitled to his appointee. Unless there's some reason uh, that would be criminal in nature or, you know, moral turpitude or something like that. But uh, uh, the executive is entitled to his appointee. And so I would say to people on both sides of the aisle, if you want to be able to, to have history judge a president, then you need to let the president do his job in the way he sees fit. Now, you may disagree with the appointments that he makes, but you don't, you don't, you're not entitled to say, well, the president can't fire people, the president can't hire people. Judge Trump by the job he does. And I think when we look back four years from now or eight years from now, that's the basis upon which we should be able to evaluate him, not on who the Democrats were successfully able to block so that he couldn't get his appointee. Donald Trump said one of the smartest things I've heard this morning. And when they were asking him about how he dismissed Rex Tillerson, he said, Rex Tillerson's a great man and he did a fine job serving his country, but he didn't agree with me on things. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Fired. You know, it's like yeah. you, the, the secretary of state does not agree with the president. So he has to go. It doesn't matter how good he was at his job. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see how things roll out from here. Um, I, for one, am excited to see that uh, the CIA will be under female leadership for the first time. Uh, I, I know this wouldn't have happened under a Hillary Clinton administration because she owes too many men for the position that she got herself into. <laughs> um, and she, she, there are some issues that would ensure that we would continue have a continuum at the CIA just to keep things quiet. Uh, for Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible. 